Canadian Newsline is brought to you by the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. Guyana's opposition unrelenting in its protests to force the president to call elections. Our top story in Caribbean News Line 4, Tuesday, September 24th, from the CMC News Center in Bridgetown. I'm Ricardo Roberts. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Guyana's main opposition People's Progressive Party, the PPP, is stepping up calls for President David Granger to announce a date for elections. The PPP held a candlelight vigil and protest Monday night outside the Arthur Chung Conference Center in Georgetown, where Granger was addressing a reception to mark the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. The demonstration followed a call by the Commonwealth Secretariat earlier in the day for Granger to immediately set a date for the polls, which it said is constitutionally overdue, given the passage of a no-confidence vote against the government last December. Last Thursday, Chairman of the Guyana Elections Commission, GCOM, advised the President that the body would be ready to hold elections by the end of February 2020. Opposition leader Barra Jagdeo warned last night that the protests will intensify until Granger sets a date. And we want an early election called now by Granger, not any election date, because that's what I think they want to hang on to and probably let the time drift again so that he thinks that we may not be able to sustain this. But let me tell him, the protest will intensify. Yep. Every single day that it goes on, which passes, where he doesn't call the elections and at an early date, the protest will intensify. We will internationalize it. We'll point out how this government is currently on that dictatorship because therefore everyone has recognized now, including the international bodies, that we no longer have constitutional rule in Guyana. Meantime, word came Tuesday that President Granger will address the nation Wednesday night regarding elections. The announcement came after he met with his cabinet to discuss the issue of holding the polls at the earliest possible time. It also came more than nine months after the coalition government was toppled in a no-confidence motion. The Granger administration has been accused of breaching the constitution. But the president has dismissed the claim, stressing that his government is focused on holding credible elections. The International Court of Justice, the ICJ, has informed the Guyana government that it will carry out oral hearings on its jurisdiction in the border row case against Venezuela. The arguments will take place in The Hague from the 23rd to the 27th of March next year. On Tuesday, the government, through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, said it welcomed the notification by the ICJ on the issue. The hearing will determine whether the ICJ has jurisdiction over the case filed by Guyana on March 29, 2018. Guyana moved to the court for a final settlement on the border contro controversy following the advice of the United Nations Sec Secretary General. Guyana is seeking to obtain a final and binding judgment from the court that the 1899 arbitral award, which established the location of the land boundary between then British Guiana and Venezuela, remains valid and binding, and that Guyana's Essequibo region belongs to Guyana and not Venezuela. Venezuela has claimed in a letter to the court that the UN Secretary General exceeded his authority under the Geneva Agreement and that the court therefore lacks jurisdiction to adjudicate Guyana's lawsuit. Venezuela has already indicated that it will not participate in the proceedings. The Foreign Affairs Ministry said if the court decides that it has jurisdiction, then it will proceed to rule on the merits of those claims and decide whether the validity of the 1899 arbitral award and the border between 
the two states should be confirmed. Under the United Nations Charter and the ICJ's own rules, its final judgments both on jurisdiction and the merits will be legally binding on Guyana and Venezuela, whether or not Venezuela participates in their proceedings. Guyana and other Caribbean countries are beginning to count the cost of the potential fallout from the collapse of UK tour company Thomas Cook. Tourism Minister Edmund Bartlett travelled to London Tuesday to meet with officials there on the matter. Now, before leaving, Bartlett told the news conference the development will have implications for arrivals this year. We get more in this report from TVJ News. Heading into the 2019-2020 tourism winter season, Mr. Bartlett says the ministry had anticipated increased visitor arrivals and stopovers. However, while remaining optimistic, he admits that this new development will create challenges for those targets. Uh, we have 10 rotations out of the Nordics uh, between this now October and March of next year. But we have already moved to, to speak to other airlines um, and, and the tour operators like TUI to, to pick up that slack. Uh, there's a German uh, fallout too, which again, um, TUI will come into play. And there's a small fallout out of Canada, which is also being covered. So we are taking the steps. I'm going there. We're being aggressive about it. Um, we're going to continue to show that Jamaica is a destination that is open um, to everyone, particularly our friends in Europe who have been affected by this. It's understood that while Thomas Cook has been having financial issues for several months, Sunday's declaration was still a surprise. The Jamaica Hotel and Tourist Association, JHTA, confirmed that several hotels, including Half Moon, Round Hill, and Ibera Star, host varying numbers of visitors through Thomas Cook packages. The company liquidation now raises questions about outstanding payments to local hotels for current guests. The arrangement through the ATAL system, which is a fund that has been set up, much like our Tourism Enhancement Fund here, to ensure that when situations like these occur, the, um, the suppliers are protected. So they will be paid for all of those visitors who are here. There are also scores of packages for future dates between October and March. Tuesday's trip to London is expected to address those bookings, hopefully alleviating any fallout in numbers. And that report from TVJ's Herman Green coming out of Jamaica and not Guyana as previously stated. Meanwhile, Antigua and Barbuda does not anticipate the collapse of Thomas Cook will, neg will negatively affect its tourism industry. Tourism Minister Charles Fernandez says the company operated only one flight weekly during the winter season. And he says Virgin Atlantic is now looking into uh, to accommodate the displaced passengers. So far, the bookings for this year uh, to come is for this season is, I think, two, 996. Now, that actually represents less than one half percent of our visitors out of the UK. Virgin is, in any case, uh, they agreed to put an extra flight on starting, uh, I think it's in January next, next, next year. You're watching Caribbean Newsline. The Bahamas Prime Minister, Dr. Hubert Minnis, is defending his creation of a ministry to tackle disaster recovery following the devastation caused by Hurricane Dorian in Abaco and Grand Bahama earlier this month. Iram Lewis was on Monday sworn in as the Minister of State for the Ministry of Disaster Preparedness, Management and Reconstruction. Critics say the move has only increased the red tape in the hurricane relief efforts. But Prime Minister Minnis insists it will do just the opposite. Theo Seeley of Eyewitness News reports. Less than 24 hours after the announcement was made, the opposition Progressive Liberal Party questioned why the Minnis administration sought to add another layer of bureaucracy to what appears to be an already strained process. Well, the Prime Minister says it's a move that many will soon respect as forward thinking. No, this is not a layer of bureaucracy. In fact, this accelerates the process. That's the, whole, that's the reason you have an authority. The authority is so that professional individuals, individuals who would know how to manage and make decisions and the best decisions that are applicable for what's happening today, um, they would be able to contract and make those decisions very quickly. 
Notwithstanding his explanation, there were critics who still questioned the relevancy of the National Emergency Management Agency, who the body would now report to, and if the new ministry headed by Lewis would make NEMA now obsolete. We're restructuring NEMA so that they've become even better than before. You learn a lot. Um, we have learned a lot from this disaster. We've learned a lot from the international agencies that were here. Um, they were very impressed with, with our organization, but still, you take it to another level. Still to come, Commonwealth Secretary General Baroness Patricia Scotland says the time has come for serious action on climate change. Stay with us. More news after this. When you think of what we went through with Hurricane Irma, you had to be able to recognize what are the things we need to do to cope with the aftermath. The psychological trauma to me is probably the most telling on a lot of people. Preparedness is the key. So when people are prepared, when people have the, they have the, what their resources in terms of how they can cope with the disaster, they're better able to be able to uh, return to their normal life, they're better able to make decisions that are informed for themselves and for their family and then for their community. Be ready, look, listen and link. So we added the garlic and the pepper to found it in a mortar. Put some water to make our paste. Time for a party paste now. Okay guys, so we're gonna add our fish now with plant to add a fish. How do you feel about a woman working and being a wife? So, in what way? I mean, and, you know, like, would you prefer her to be outside of the home or inside the home? To me, uh, both. Um, you know, I, I grew up in the South, you know, so my mom, my wife always says my mom was like super mom, but, you know, she was also um, superintendent of Jackson County School District, but she also was a mother. Uh -huh. um, so she took care of me and my sister and my dad, so she, you know, did everything. So I, I wasn't raised with a woman only saying just staying at home. Yo, I go feel so good. I go be like, I might get butterflies. Like, like why? Normally. Why would? Why would I? I mean, come on. Yo, that mean that this woman is truly and real into me without a shadow of a doubt. Don't try that. God mean? took so the ribs wait, wait, out wait, of wait, man. Wait, wait, God took the ribs out of man, and it's a man job to provide. Where is that in the Bible? It Show it in the Bible where it says that man should be the one proposing to woman. I, I, I never see that do come with that. No woman I should. Know. Commonwealth Secretary General Baroness Patricia Scotland says countries can no longer afford to talk on the issue of climate change. A warning followed Monday's climate summit at the United Nations. In an interview with CMC News, Baron Scotland pointed to the recent devastation caused by Hurricane Dorian in Grand Bahama and the Abaco Islands as further proof that urgent action is needed to reduce the impact of climate change. She noted that more countries are coming on board to assist small island states in that regard. So what now do we do? And how quickly can we do it? And how do we raise the money to make sure that that which needs to happen actually does happen? And there are a number of countries who are doubling their contribution to uh, the, the Green Climate Fund. And there were more and more countries saying that we have to come together and to work out what works and what does not work. And you will know that in the Commonwealth, we've created the Climate Finance Access Hub in which we are able to place advisors in a number of small uh, and uh, least developed countries to assist them to get that money. Barony Scotland also lauded the efforts of CARICOM leaders for continuing to make a case for industrialized nations to cap global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius. Of them are banging this drum and they are not 
sitting down. They are making sure that the rest of the world understands that their failure to address this issue will end up in real damage to those of us who hail from the Caribbean. And what is happening now, therefore, is this action plan that we in the Commonwealth Secretariat are seeking to put together with all of our um, uh, partners is starting to work. Well, climate change is already beginning to affect food security in the region. In Belize, farmers have lost an estimated $50 million so far this year as a result of the ongoing drought. Sugar, corn and livestock have been particularly hard hit. We get the details in this report from Channel 5 News. The lack of rain has caused massive crop and livestock losses, currently estimated to be north of $50 million. Minister of Agriculture Godwin Hulls provides a detailed analysis of the major crops and the hit they have suffered as a result of the extended drought, beginning with the sugar industry. In sugar, we understand that there's about 30 to 50 percent what they can consider damaged, and this is prelim primarily a significant decrease in the regrowth and development, the stark thickness of the plant, the height of the plant, and the active leaves. And so the, the estimate is that there will be a significant reduction in delivery of cane in the upcoming 2019-2020 season. It is predicted that in the 2019-2020 season, sugarcane harvest will be declining by roughly 30%, down to about 900,000 tons of cane delivered to the mill at Tower Hill. This will, as a consequence, result in significantly lower sugar production, which will affect Belize's foreign exchange revenue. Insofar as livestock, the cattle industry has also been dealt a crippling blow. While cattle aren't dying due to a lack of water and grass, there are reports of massive weight loss, an average of 50 pounds per cow. At $1.50 per pound of beef, it is easy to see where farmers are losing at the meat shop. Livestock took a big hit, but livestock is a little touchy because the figures given to me that it's about 60,300 heads of cattle that have been affected, not dead, means they lost weight, they get maga, they didn't have water, never had grass. So the estimate is a roughly about 50 pounds per animal, and of course at $1.50 a pound, it's a significant reduction. The Ministry of Agriculture has also established a transparent criteria for awarding assistance to the most deserving farmers and ranchers, and has put in place a management structure for rapid distribution and approval of all support measures. And ahead in Newsline Sport, Jamaica Talawas hand Barbados Tridents a five-run defeat in their latest CPL encounter at Kensington Oval. Stay with us. Sport is next. They were here because you were involved recently got a rather large verdict against the largest and most successful helmet in the country, the hell. $11 million verdict, 11.1. 11.5. 11.5. And yeah. it was a very unique you know, I, I've done a lot of cases over the years. I've represented a lot of people that have really, really been hurt. And in my opinion, Rhett had suffered the worst injury that anybody had ever seen. Don't remember anything after walking to the restroom. Connie Williams claims she was drugged and raped while visiting Oklahoma City in 2011. She underwent a rape exam in her hometown of Tulsa and was told by an officer her rape kit would be sent to Oklahoma City. For several years, she was assured her case was being investigated. But then in 2017, came the bombshell. The assistant DA in 2012 closed the case due to lack of evidence. I have some concerns about this idea that uh, because we are panicking, we're not also thinking strategically. The, certainly many of the countries have looked at citizen security loans and programs. Some have been funded by the international agencies. We have had a lot of money put into it. But what I think is making people panic is the, what we call the senseless violence, the kind of organized crime. When business can't operate in certain parts of whether it's Georgetown or Kingston without a payola. All-rounder Dwayne Smith returned to haunt his former team Barbados Tridents as Jamaica Tala was inflicted a demoralizing five-run defeat to the horse in a low-scoring last-over thriller at Kensington Oval on Monday night. 
In a match watched by England's Barbadian fast bowling sensation Drew for Archer, Talawas batted poorly after being sent in and were dismissed for 127 of the 20 overs with in-form opener Glenn Phillips stroking 41 of 35 balls and Ramal Lewis providing a late flourish with 27 of 22 deliveries. Trident's managed just two runs from the first over, two overs before Alex Hales responded with two sixes of George Wilker's left arm spin in the third over but perished in the following over to a diving catch by Englishman Jade Dernbach at backward square off 20-year-old left arm spinner Zahir Khan. Now, when Justin Graves and J.P. Dumini fell in successive overs, the scoring rate had slowed to a trickle at just over four and the fifth and over to leave Trident's going nowhere at 43-3 for three in the ninth over. Jonathan Carton ejected some urgency into the innings with 17 or 15 balls, hosting 31 with Charles, who counted three fours. But Springer struck in successive overs to remove both in a devastating 27 ball period which saw five wickets tumble for 16 runs. On 90 for 8 at the start of the 18th over, the game was Talawas for the taking and Smith held his nerve to ensure there was no Trident's comeback. Meanwhile, head coach Phil Simmons' message to opponents is not to rule out the Barbados Tridents from the CPL even though they've won only two matches so far. CBC's Sean Green also spoke with Captain Jason Holder who hailed the performances of two new young players for the Tridents. The answer to the question of what went wrong for the Barbados Tridents against the unbeaten Guyana Amazon Warriors in their opening home fixture at Kensington Oval is simple. The Tridents were simply outplayed. Coach Phil Simmons did warn them about the spinners. I think it's important we have to play spin well because we know they have four, sometimes five spinners. Uh, we have to play spin well. Yet the batsmen seemed very impatient against the slow bowlers, gifting away seven wickets to the Warrior spinners. I believe that even though it's a T20 game, you still have to be selective and try not to smash every ball for six. Even though Justin Gray has failed at Kensington Oval, I will still keep him at number three behind Johnson Charles or Alex Hills. He can certainly get the ball away and he knows the conditions well. The other option would be to rest either one of the spinners and play Graves and let Lenico Boucher punch out three. His talent is wasted down the order. Captain Jason Holder spoke highly of Graves and even young Joshua Bishop who both played well against the Zooks. Two young bright sparks and it's really good to see them coming in in their deb debut games and, and shining you know both of them played really well. Um, Justin got us off to a really good start you know we were probably lacking a little bit of impetus in the power plays thus far and you know he came in and played a really good innings and you know Joshua, Joshua was and for me phenomenal you know coming in his first game against Rakim and, and Fletcher who've been uh, obviously doing really well for the St. Lucia Zooks and, and very very aggressive but he held his nerve and you know, he got some wickets for us up front. Regarding Ashley Nurse, if he maintains a place in the 11, he will be more effective as a pinch hitter rather than a bowler because he hasn't done much with the ball so far but his batting has been fairly good down the order. His fielding also needs much improvement. Trinidad are currently fourth on the points table but have played less games than everyone else and that means that they have time to improve and move up the ladder. Um, we're in a good position. Two games away um, is, is what, we, what we could have asked for, and we got that. So we come back home now, and you try and win as many as, at home as possible. So we're in a good position as, as for the tournament. Um, some teams have played a lot of more games than we have, and lower than us in the table. So from that point of view, we're in a very good position, and just trying to make sure that, as I said before, we win a, more than two or three games at home. Switching sports now, the renaming of Jamaica's table tennis body will not see the light of day. This follows a recent court ruling that deemed the body's annual general meeting null and void. TVJ's Ronaldo Brown explains. A Supreme Court ruling on Tuesday rendered the recent special meeting and annual general meeting of the Jamaica Table Tennis Association null and void. The decision by the court not only left the presidency of the association vacant, but also repealed the name change that came into effect on January 28. A letter retrieved by TVJ Sports has now seemingly put a halt on any intention to push for a name change to Table Tennis Jamaica. The letter dated September 19 was addressed to Godfrey Lothian, president of the Jamaica Table Tennis Association, with the signature of Tennis Jamaica president John Azar fixed. According to the letter, Mr. Lothian approached Tennis Jamaica in the past few weeks seeking permission to register Table Tennis Jamaica after the company's Office of Jamaica declared that both names were too similar. 
Mr. Azar noted that he had promised to discuss the matter at Tennis Jamaica's board meeting later this month, only to be made aware that the name Table Tennis Jamaica was already being used. In conclusion, Mr. Azar noted, quote, in light of the above factors and having consulted with members of my executive and board, I now formally advise that we will not grant permission for you to use the name Table Tennis Jamaica as we do concur with the view of the company's office that the names are in fact too close and members of the public might be led to wrongly associate the actions of one association or the issues facing one association with that of the other, end quote. The letter also asks that the JTTA immediately desist from using the name Table Tennis Jamaica. And finally, in horse racing, Jamaica riding star Sean Bridgemohan partnered with favorite Covefi to destroy the field in record breaking time and win the feature 125,000 US dollar dogwood stakes at Church Hill Downs on the weekend. Going seven furlongs for the three year old Phillies, the pair stalked pace setter Take Charge Angel before bursting to the front at the top of the stretch and producing a stunning run to reach the wire ace lengths clear in a stakes record 1 minute 21.51 seconds. Travis Stone has the call. Outside, fourth and now third with three and a half for lungs to go. Bell's the one is two lengths farther back in fifth and at the back is stretch running champagne anyone. Round the far turn, take charge angel. Kofefi looms. Free cover comes up three wide in the outside. These three right across the track at the quarter pole where Kofefi takes over. Kofefi now in front. Take Charge Angel back into second. Free cover fully extended in third. Bells to one is fourth. Istan Council's fifth. Nothing from Champagne. Anyone. Kofefi sails by the eighth pole. Clear by six. Now by seven. Now by eight. Kofefi primed and ready for the Breeders' Cup. Gallops home to win it by six lengths in the end. Bells the one was second. Free cover was third. Istan Council fourth. And that's the sport. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Several key Tobago House of Assembly projects are ongoing. And to ensure they remain both on time and on schedule, THA Chief Secretary Honorable Kelvin Charles led a tour of the projects recently. Also on the tour were Councillor Kwesi Devines, the Secretary of Infrastructure Quarries and the Environment, and a Technical Advisor at the Infrastructure Division, Telshon Mark Wellington. The team's first stop was Thompson River Bridge in Lowland. Again, the major developments of this day, Guyana's opposition unrelenting in its protest to force and calling of an election, even as President David Granger says he will make an announcement on the matter on Wednesday night. And in sports, Jamaica Tala was hand Barbados Stridents a 500 defeat in the latest CPL encounter at Kensington Oval. As Caribbean Newsline for News and Sports Round the Clock, subscribe to carnalnews.com. For more for our programming, log on to carabision.tv and check out our YouTube channel. We'll be back here again tomorrow for all of our CLC. Thank you for watching. Have a successful day.